Today's video will be part three of analyzing blood test number five in 2022's results. In part one, we saw my biological age data, including Levine's biological age, which showed that I was 15.6 years younger than my chronological. And similarly, using aging.ai, 18.6 years younger than my chronological. Now, in part two, we looked at potential weaknesses in my data, including total cholesterol levels and DHEA sulfate. So in part three, we'll see what's contributing to these data. So let's start off by having a look at supplements. Now, I mentioned this, I've mentioned this in earlier videos, but I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism in my mid-20s. So I've been taking levothyroxine uh, since then. For this blood test, 137.5 micrograms per day. And then I occasionally take melatonin uh, at night, either before bed or in the middle of the night when I wake up. So I took it very sporadically for this test, only three of the 42 days that correspond to this blood test that I take melatonin. And in that case, it was a very small amount, such that my average melatonin intake over that period was less than 11 micrograms per day. Note that's micrograms and not milligrams. And then usually I take vitamin D because I live in Boston uh, where there isn't, I don't get much sun exposure unless it's the summertime. But because it's the summertime, I didn't take any vitamin D. Instead, I got regular sun, full body sun exposure at least two to three days per week or as many days more than that that I could get uh, and 30 to 35 minutes per session. Now I've gone for longer than an hour per session in the past, but I, I've noticed some sun damage. So for this summer, I decided to go uh, for at most 30 to 35 minutes per day when I got regular sun exposure. And that's it. No other supplements, no gear protectors or Xenolinux. So what about diet? How does diet relate to blood test number five in 2022? So first, how am I tracking diet? So we can see that I blood tested on August 22nd of 2022, but that says nothing about how diet may relate to that. So uh, I did mention that there was a 42-day period when I talked about melatonin. So the, so the average daily dietary intake from my last blood test, which was on July 11th, through the day before this blood test on August 21st, so that 42-day period, corresponds to blood test number five in 2022. So let's just go through that approach a little bit more for people who may not be familiar. So here we're looking at the calendar, more specifically July and August of 2022. So we can see blood test number four on J July 11th, and we can see blood test number five on August 22, and those 42 days in between. Now, every day since 2015, or April 2015, and more specifically for the 42 days that corresponded to this blood test, I've weighed all my food using a food, a food scale, and more specifically, this exact uh, version uh, the, of, of a food scale right there. So I then entered those food amounts into chronometer, and this is just what I've used since 2015. It's easy to use, uh, and I can't say which is the best. That's just what I use. And if you're interested in using chronometer, I have a discount link. Uh, check out the video's description. So I then entered daily chronometer data into a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, nothing special. And the average intake for those 42 days, including individual food amounts, macro and micronutrients, would then correspond to blood test number five. So uh, note that each blood test since 2015 then has a corresponding diet composition. So because I have a lot of data for both diet and blood biomarkers that correspond, I can then cal calculate correlations for diet with blood biomarkers. And then based on that data, I can alter my dietary intake to optimize blood biomarkers. So let's start off with uh, looking at individual food amounts that corresponded to blood test number five in 2022. So this will be the average intake for that 42-day period. And just as detailed in earlier videos, so at the top, top right and top left, we've got the amount in grams uh, sorted by rank. So the most abundant food that I ate would have a rank of one and all the way down to the lowest, uh, would be, which would be walnuts on this plot, uh, 21 grams per day. So in earlier videos, uh, I've addressed why these foods are at the top, carrots, strawberries, mushrooms, red bell pepper, beets, collard greens, and watermelon. And if you're interested in that analysis, uh, it'll be in the right corner. It's uh, in test number four in 2022. So again, it'll be in the right corner. Now, the primary goal for this blood test was to maintain test number fours and overall 2022's improved biomarker data when compared with the previous two years of data, uh, 12 blood tests. So in other words, to keep the diet mostly the same. But I'm always making small tweaks to the diet with the, with the goal of further optimization. It's never a perfect system. Uh, so I did make some changes for this uh, blood test and diet. So what were those? So uh, there were some unintentional changes. I'll start with that. So we can see that my strawberry intake for test number four was 622 grams per day. And for this test, it was about half that. Now, Costco ran out of strawberries. I usually get frozen organic strawberries. They ran out, so I didn't have a choice but to use, uh, I, li I like having berries in my diet. 
um, for many reasons. But uh, so I had to switch to a three berry mix that included strawberries, but also blackberries and blueberries. So we can see that for this test, I had significantly, significantly higher levels of blackberries and blueberries when compared with test number four, which I didn't have any. So that was an unintentional change. What about intentional changes? And one of those was sardines. So you can see that I in significantly increased my sardine intake from an average of 99 grams per day in test number four to 114 grams per day for test number five. So why did I do that? Well, the majority of my B12 intake comes from sardines. So for test number five, that was 11.4 11, micrograms per day uh, of B12 that came specifically from sardines. And note that my total B12 intake is 12.2 micrograms. So that's almost exclusively all from sardines. And the RDA for B12 is 2.4. So I'm already, you know, four to four, four to five fold higher um, for the RDA just from sardine intake. So prior to this test, the importance of B12 is that B12 was significantly correlated with lower homocysteine in my data. So before going, going into that story, first let's take a look at why homocysteine is important. So here we're looking at how homocysteine is associated with uh, uh, organ systems in terms of uh, function and or health. And more specifically, we can see that when homocysteine is relatively high, uh, greater than 15 micromolar as shown in the middle, it's associated with adverse health and or function of many organ systems, including cardiovascular, uh, brain, eyes and ears, the reproductive apparatus in women, pancreas, bone, and kidney. Now also note that homocysteine increases during aging. And we can see that here with plasma levels of uh, total homocysteine on the y-axis plotted against age going from 12 year olds all the way up to older than 80 year olds. And we can see that for both men and women, homocysteine significantly increases during aging from values of around six to seven micromolar in youth to values of around 11 to 12 micromolar in around 80 or 80 year olds. So what about older than 80 years old? If, if, you, if you're familiar with this channel, the, my motto is to conquer aging or die trying, and I'm serious about that. I don't want to just get to 80 or 90. I really intend on living uh, as long as I physically can and hope, hopefully breaking the longevity world record, 123 years old. So what does homocysteine look like in older than 80 years old? So here we're looking at data from a study of more than 1,700 centenarians. These are people that had a median age, as, as you can see on the left, of 100 years. And for homocysteine, for serum levels of homocysteine in this group, we can see that their values was, were 23.1 micromolar, which is even higher off the, off the chart when compared with the aging data up to 80 year olds. So in other words, if we live long enough, we may all have elevated homocysteine. Now I mentioned that prior to this test, B12 was significantly correlated with lower homocysteine in my data. So let's take a look at that. And we can see that here and note that I, I've, uh, I don't have a lot of data before 2017, even though I've been tracking diet since 2015, but from 2017 to 2022, I've been tracking homocysteine virtually with every blood test. So I have 20 blood test measurements over the past five years for that. So we can see that the higher my B12 intake, the lower my blood levels of homocysteine are with a correlation coefficient of negative, negative 0.65. So it's an inverse correlation. And we can see that P value is less than 0.05. So it's a significant correlation. Now note that uh, for, uh, for the largest, what appear to be the largest changes, uh, it's with methyl B12 supplementation with an average homocysteine level of 9.4 micromolar uh, with relatively higher levels of B12 in my, in, in my diet or supplementing with it. In contrast, when I don't supplement with it or haven't supplement, supplement, supplemented with it uh, over these 20 blood tests, we can see that it's higher at 11.9 micromolar. So then the easy question would be, why not just supplement with B12? What do you, what do you care if you get you know, uh, 12 micrograms or 10 micrograms from diet, why not just uh, take a thousand a day as I've done for many blood tests as shown on this plot? Well, a relatively higher B12 intake is significantly correlated with more blood biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. So let's detail that approach uh, by taking a look at the data. So here we're gonna take a look at correlations for B12 intake with big picture blood biomarkers as shown here. So for those who may not be familiar with this approach, what are the big picture biomarkers? Uh, so they include things like glucose, but also homocysteine uh, as just directly under it, three markers of kidney function, three markers of liver function, all the major lipoproteins, uh, immune-related cells and globulins, which are proteins, three red, red blood cell-related measures, including red blood cells themselves, a marker of inflammation, high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, and then the overall biological age score using Levine's test and aging.ai. Now there's a little bit more information on this plot. So we can see that the little n next to each biomarker is how many blood tests that I have that uh, correspond since 2015. So for example, we can see glucose, I have 37 glucose measurements since 2015. 
And then the R, the little R at the top left, is the correlation coefficient. And the p-value is the measure of statistical significance with less than 0.05 being a significant uh, uh, correlation. All right, so what's significantly correlated for B12 with these big picture biomarkers? So first, as, as you saw in the last plot, and this was uh, up to 20 blood tests, so that was my thinking after the last blood test, test number four. So this is, uh, I've reevaluated the correlations after every blood test. So we can see now homocysteine has 21 blood test measurements in that plot. So we can see that the correlation is a little bit different. But nonetheless, we can see that B12 is, is still significantly correlated with lower homocysteine. So I've given it a green arrow as that's going in the right direction in terms of aging and or all-cause mortality risk. However, relatively higher B12 is significantly correlated with higher glucose, higher blood urea nitrogen, BUN, higher alkaline phosphatase, uh, higher levels of neutrophils and monocytes, but a lower lymphocyte percentage. Now, in terms of how each of these biomarkers uh, change during aging and their association with all-cause mortality risk, these correlations are going in the wrong direction. So I've given them red arrows. Now, uh, B12 is also significantly correlated with three other biomarkers too higher LDL, higher platelets, and higher red blood cells. Now, these aren't as straightforward as the aging and all-cause mortality data. For example, red blood cells and platelets decline during aging. So these positive correlations with B12 would suggest it's going in the right direction uh, because we, it, it could potentially reverse that age-related decline. But within my own data, doing a biomarker versus biomarker analysis, there, too, there is such a thing as even being too high, even within the reference range, at least for me. So that's why I've given red blood cells and platelets red arrows because too high within my data is significantly correlated with an overall biomarker profile that's got more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. And then the LDL story is a little bit more complicated, but if anybody's interested in that, just leave a comment and I'll detail uh, all of the biomarkers that, um, uh, or, or they, I'll, I'll detail the LDL story, why I've given that a red arrow. All right, so with the, all these red arrows and only one going in the right direction, homocysteine, we can see that B12 has a net correlative score of minus eight. So what does that mean? What do I do with that information? So these are rules that I've set up. Uh, and so if the net score is positive, I would eat above my average intake. And if the net score was equal to zero, I would eat at my average intake. So in this situation, the net score is negative and very strongly negative, which suggests I should eat below my average intake for B12 in order to minimize any potential adverse effects on multiple biomarkers. So my average B12 intake since 2015 is 542 micro, uh, micrograms per day. And note that, uh, so some could say, well, just take in 300 micrograms per day or one or 200 micrograms per day. But homocysteine wasn't dramatically reduced at 300 micrograms per day with an average of about 10 micromolar. So um, with that in mind, I tried to increase my sardine intake, granted a very small increase, but I thought it was possible that maybe there were some bioavailability, bioavailability issues. If I got a little bit more from food, would that be better than taking a mega dose of B12 that I would never see you know, just by eating real food? Clearly that didn't work, so I'm gonna have to come up with another strategy to reduce B12. And I have other homocysteine videos, so those that wanna say try TMG, uh, trimethylglycine or folate and B6, I've already detailed that, that in other videos and those approaches didn't work for me. So what about the rest of the diet? I've already detailed the first 23 foods. What about the remainder of the diet? And we can see that here, again, same approach. Uh, in terms of the highest amount of foods at the top, uh, down to the lowest intakes at the bottom, and ranked in terms of highest to lowest in terms of intake. So in, te in terms of intentional changes, I also reduced date intake for this test, 25 grams per day for test number four, about half that for this test, and that's because blueberries and blackberries have higher levels of fructose than strawberries. So for test number four, I was only consuming exclusively strawberries, and because of the higher intake of blueberries and blackberries, that was increasing my fructose intake, and as we'll see in a minute, too much fructose in my diet is correlate, significantly correlated with more blood biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. So to uh, ameliorate that, I reduced my data intake, which has a lot of fructose. Now, why that's important and how that relates to the homocysteine story is that a relatively higher data intake is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine in my data. And we can see that here. So I, I have less data because uh, for data intake because I've been tracking food since 2018 whereas I've been tracking macros and micros since 2015. Nonetheless, I've got 13 data points that correspond to between homocysteine and data intake as shown in this plot. And we can see that it's an inverse correlation, which means that the higher my data intake has been, the lower my homocysteine is. And again, I'm not suggesting causation, this is a correlation. Nonetheless, it's a strong correlation, as you can see with a correlation coefficient of negative 0.85. So then uh, 
uh, I should mention for this test, we can see that my highest homocysteine over this three year period was for this blood test. So that would suggest just go as high as possible for dates and that if correlation equals causation, I should expect to see a reduction for homocysteine. Well, note that dates have a net correlative score of minus four in my data. So that suggests that I should increase them to somewhere below my average intake of 29 grams per day. So I'm aiming for about 25 grams per day for this test. And note that uh, I'm not convinced that dates will do anything to homocysteine. It's possible that my date intake was just highest when I was supplementing with B12 and the B12 is the real effect and dates were just a passenger on that journey. If that's true, I'm not planning on supplementing with B12 for the up for my next blood test in October. So if homocysteine comes down and it's in part because of higher dates, that will be reflected in the correlations. If that's not the case, this correlation will then weaken and I'd expect other stuff to pop up and I'll continue to follow correlations until I find the overall approach that keeps my homocysteine relatively low. All right, so to finish up with the diet, note that, or at least the diet composition, note that my diet isn't always clean. Uh, so I do have a cheat meal or a cheat day or cheat two cheat days, if you want to call it that. So, and that happens immediately after I blood test. I have some junk and then I have some more on the day after and then I shut it down until the next blood test. So in other words, I had uh, junk for two days and then I didn't have any junk for 40 days until test number five. So that junk for this test was Nutella. And just to further uh, explain this, uh, so if you look at just the average per day, it's 3.7 grams. And someone on Reddit said, this guy's eating a, a, you know, a small amount of, of Nutella every day uh, for, for the whole blood test period, which isn't true. So uh, I had 147 grams of Nutella from uh, on the first day and the day after the blood test, uh, and then nothing for 40 days. But that average ends up being 3.7 uh, grams per day. So I mixed the Nutella with peanut butter and made homemade uh, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups, ba basically. So that's what I did. And then I also had Swedish fish. And again, that's not one, one, one gram of Swedish fish per day. I had 60 grams on the day after the blood test and then nothing for the 40 days after that. And then also I chew gum, chew gum uh, during my usually uh, 75 to 85 minute workout. Um, so that's why you see that there. All right, so what about macronutrients and micronutrients? What, uh, what, is, what do they look like for test number five? So let's uh, start off by uh, having a look at calorie, protein, and fat intake that correspond to this blood test. So first, ca calorie intake, and this is the average calorie uh, intake for the 42-day period that corresponds to this test. It was a bit under 2,300 calories. So why that amount? So let's take a look at correlation analysis using the same approach as before with B12 for calorie intake versus the big picture biomarkers. And when I do that, uh, calorie intake has a net correlative score of minus 5. In other words, its uh, calorie intake is significantly correlated with higher levels, and you can see that little plus there indicates a positive correlation or an increase in correlation uh, with higher levels of alkaline phosphatase, ALP, higher levels of the liver enzyme, aspartate aminotransferase, AST, higher LDL, higher platelets, and a higher RDW. So a negative correlative score of minus five suggests that I should eat below my average intake in order to follow correlations. So my average since 2015 has been uh, 2546. So we can see that my current uh, 2294 was below that. So we give it a green check. So note that as I mentioned, the goal is to follow as many correlations as possible for diet with blood biomarkers. You know, I don't assume that one diet or one macronutrient will fully uh, impact a given blood biomarker or many. You know, I'd expect that each biomarker has multiple inputs, in in including many biomarkers, uh, many foods that could potentially uh, positively improve it and many foods that could potentially negatively affect it. So by following the correlations, as many of them as possible for each biomarker with diet, uh, I'd expect that uh, any effects of diet on the biomarkers would be maximized or conversely, if it's a negative correlation, minimized. All right, so for protein, for this test, I averaged 97.4 grams per day, uh, which is 17% of total calories. So why that amount? Again, we, do, we go to the correlation analysis. Protein in my data has a net negative correlative score of minus eight. And we can see the biomarkers that it's significantly correlated with there. Now note that a relatively higher protein intake is significantly correlated with lower homocysteine. So if I only measured homocysteine and nothing else, and if this is a real uh, effect of protein intake, affecting homocysteine, I would then increase my protein intake to my highest level, somewhere around 150 grams per day, and think, wow, if you know I've got lower homocysteine now, I'm doing great. But if I didn't measure the other biomarkers, I'd be missing that bigger picture that in my data, when my protein intake is relatively high, I've got a lot of biomarkers going the wrong direction, and only one in this case, homocysteine going in the right. 
So a negative net correlative score suggests that I should eat below my average intake, which is 112 uh, and a half grams uh, per day. So for this test, we can see 97 is less than that. So I'm uh, following that correlation too. All right, in terms of fat intake for this test, I averaged about 83 grams per day, which is about 33% of my total calories. So why that amount? Again, we go to the correlation analysis and we can see that in my data, total fat has a net correlative score of minus seven including the biomarker shown there with the ones going the wrong direction in red and the ones go in the, going in the right direction, again, in terms of aging and all-cause mortality risk in green. So that suggests I should eat below my average intake, which we can see 83 is less than 86. So I give that a green arrow. So total fat intake divides into monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and saturated as the primary uh, composition of total fat. And I should mention that there's a glitch in uh, chronometer. If you add up monounsaturated, poly, and saturated, they don't add up to 83. And part of that is because my uh, cocoa beans are entered manually. So I have the total fat intake for them and the saturated fat intake for them, but I don't have about 20 grams, uh, whether it divides into mono or poly unsaturated. So there's a limitation there. And then the uh, type of sardines that I use gives me total fat and omega-3, but it doesn't give me some of the other fats. Uh, so there's a limitation there in using chronometer. Uh, and nonetheless, uh, monounsaturated fat has a net co correlative score of minus one in my data, which as you can see, it's uh, uh, MUFAs or monounsaturated fats are significantly correlated with higher glucose and red blood cells in my data, but a lower MCV. So two in the right direction, one in the wrong. So the net negative one suggests that I should eat below my average intake of around 17 grams per day. And we can see 15 is less than 17. So I'm following that correlation. In terms of polyunsaturated, so omega-3 has a, a score of plus three. Uh, and you can see the biomarkers there. Interestingly, one of them is phenoage. So for whatever reason, omega-3s mostly coming from sardines and flax seeds are significantly correlated with a younger Levine's biological age, at least using the blood, bi blood biomarker-based version, not the methylation-based uh, uh, phenoage that, that Levine has. So three, a net score of plus three suggests I should be above my average intake, which we can see eight is higher than seven. So we give that a check. Similarly, omega-6 has a positive score in my data. And we can see the biomarkers there. Interestingly, one of them is homocysteine. So that's one reason why I try to limit my omega-6 to somewhere around 16 grams per day, because if I go too high, that's significantly correlated with higher homocysteine. So my average uh, omega-6 uh, since 2015 is 15 and a half grams per day. So I'm just above that. So I'm following that correlation too. And I should mention, I think when most people hear omega-6, they think seed oils. As you can see by, by, by my diet composition on the earlier slides, I don't have any seed oils there. It's been a very long time since I ate any seed oils. Uh, technically, you could say there are seed oils in Nutella, but this is a, an infrequent you know, visitor in my diet. So uh, at least for now. Um, so, and I hope to keep it that way. All right, so saturated fat has a net score of minus six in my data, uh, and we can see the biomarkers there, so which suggests I should eat below my average intake of 27 grams per day since 2015. 23 is less than 27, so that too is a check. And just as a side note, it's possible that dairy fats, including cheese and yogurt, and this is a story for another day, but this is just a quick, quick YouTube short while in a longer video. Uh, most of the saturated fat story in my data may be driven by uh, saturated fatty acids from dairy. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll investigate that in future videos. So uh, we'll check it out when it comes out. All right, and then if you saw my last video on total cholesterol, um, I was planning on increasing it and I did increase it for a while, but this too is another side story. But nonetheless, we can see that cholesterol has a net negative score in my data of minus eight with those biomarkers there. So I should eat below my average intake, 126 milligrams per day, 24 is less than that. So we can give that a check. So we can see that I'm, for most of the correlations uh, I'm following, or actually I'm following all the correlations for fat intake and calories, proteins, uh, calorie protein and fat. I'm following all the correlations uh, so far. So what about carb intake? So let's start with total carbs, which is about 51% of my total calories. So why that amount? Uh, we go to the correlation analysis. Carb intake, in, for me, in my data, has a net correlative score of plus one, which suggests I should eat above my average intake. And we can see that about 238 is higher than 234, so green check. And then further subdividing carbs into fiber and sugars. Uh, fiber has a net score of plus one, which suggests, suggests I should eat above my average intake of 97 grams per day. But this is one where I'm not following it. I'm at 91. So this is an interesting one because in my data, to get to higher than 91, to get to higher than 97, actually, I'd have to really bump up uh, vegetables, you know, non-starchy vegetables like broccoli. But in my data, broccoli actually has a net negative score with uh, big picture biomarkers. So um, there may be actually a range, even though my rules say that when the score is positive, 
to eat above average intake. Note that that score is one. If it was seven, maybe it would be a really big deal on the blood biomarkers that I'm not higher than that. But when it's one or minus one, it's right within that range of one standard deviation. So is 91 really different from 97 versus 99? Maybe not. And that may be the case for other biomarkers uh, as they relate to diet, as we'll see in a minute. All right, so another, uh, in terms of sugars, I further subdivide that into total fructose because I eat a lot of fruit. And that's important because total fructose has a net negative correlative score in my data of minus three. So I keep an eye on my total fruit intake, including total fructose. Uh, and note that sucrose divided by two plus fructose equals total fructose. So that suggests I should eat below my average intake of 85 grams per day of fructose. 65 is less than 85, so we give that a green check. So what about micronutrients? So we'll start off with vitamins, and I'm just going to run through some of these. I'm not going to go through all. I'm just going to highlight maybe the, the big ones. So one of the big ones for vitamins for me seems to be niacin, uh, B3. And again, this is all from whole food. So uh, a score of plus 7 suggests I should eat above my average intake, which you can see 42 is higher than about 36, so we give it a green check. Now, what I want to highlight here is that the RDA for, uh, for niacin is 16 milligrams per day. So I'm about two and a half times higher. So using this approach, I can get closer to the you know, a precision nutrition in conjunction with a biomarker optimization. So it's basically optimizing two things at the same time. Uh, now, I, what would happen if I ate niacin that was somewhere around the RDA, 18 milligrams per day? Would I lose you know, the, uh, cor you know, the correlative score is very positive. Would I lose the potential effect that niacin may have on multiple biomarkers? It's a possibility. All right, so then B12, as we saw, it has a net correlative score of minus eight. My average is 542. We can see 12 is below 542, so I'm following that correlation. And then last on this list is beta carotene. Now, when I first started this approach, uh, I was showing, I had a very reductionist approach. I was showing uh, correlations between individual nutrients with individual biomarkers and not even considering the rest of the biomarkers. So we can see that beta carotene has a net negative, very strong net negative correlative score of minus eight. So it is sig still significantly correlated with higher albumin, which is good because albumin declines during aging, but it's significantly correlated with nine biomarkers going in the wrong direction. So with that in mind, I should eat below my average intake, which is 54,000 micrograms per day. We can see that 50,000 is less than that. So green check. All right, so the rest of the vitamins, some highlights. We can see that vitamin D, uh, th I, just from food, I average th about 300 IUs per day, and that's below the RDA of 600 IUs per day. Now, again, note that I don't supplement with vitamin D in the summer, or I generally don't, and that's because I'm getting regular sun exposure. So some could say, well, how do you know you're not deficient? Well, I have 10 at-home blood tests using the company Quantify, and if you missed the that missed that information, it's in my last video, but there'll be a link in the video's description if you want to use uh, their product. And I have a disco, uh, discount code, sorry. So my average vitamin D over those 10 tests during this 42-day period is, is about 64 nanograms per, per mil. Now, deficient for vitamin D is considered less than 30. Above 30, what's optimal is very debatable, um, but I'm definitely not deficient. I'm far from it, you know, based on the, my circulating blood levels of 25-hydroxyvitamin uh, D. All right, and then vitamin K has a net correlative score of plus two. And the reason that I've highlighted this is because we can see that my average intake is more than 1,500 micrograms per day. And for this blood test, it was close to 2,000 micrograms per day. And because the score was positive, I should be above my average, so we give it a green check. So note, in this case, the, what's defined as the RDA or an adequate intake, AI, is only 120 micrograms per day. And I'm at 16 fold higher than what's uh, you know, uh, been determined to be an adequate intake for vitamin K. Now, if that was too much, I'd expect to see more bi biomarkers, more blood biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right. And in support of that, you can see my B12 intake has a very strong negative correlative score uh, for being very high above the RDA. For vitamin K, in my case, the opposite is true. 16, 16 times higher than the RDA is not significantly correlated with many biomarkers going the wrong direction than right. All right, and then let's take a look at minerals. So highlighting some that I haven't highlighted in other videos, including copper, which has a net correlative score of plus three. And I get a lot of copper from mushrooms, but also some from cocoa beans. So the plus three suggests I should go above my average since 2015 of 4.3 milligrams per day. And we can see that 4.7 is higher than that. So green check. Now note that the RDA for copper is 0.9 milligrams per day. So I'm more than five-fold higher for the RDA for copper. And I mentioned this in my test number four video for, for diet, for the diet breakdown, but there seem to be no hard and fast rules in terms of how high one should go for the RDA. They seem to be very specific. 
maybe five times higher for copper is optimal for me. Maybe 16 times higher for vitamin K, again, optimal for me. But B12 going way higher, you know, we can see that that's not the case. Only two and a half fold higher for niacin maybe, maybe optimal for me. So there's no standard if you're two times higher or four times higher than the RDA for all nutrients. It seems like each nutrient has its own specific range for what may be optimal. And it may even be individual. Some people may have different ranges, you know, um, compared to others. And then last on this list that I want to take a look at is magnesium, which has a net score of zero, which suggests that I should eat at my average intake of 802, but we can see I'm at 696, so we would give that a, a, a red X. That Technically, I'm not following the correlation. But note that the RDA for uh, magnesium is 420, 420 milligrams per day. So I'm above that. Uh, you know, Now, uh, I'm above that, but I'm not exactly at 800, which is what following my own rules for these correlations it would suggest. Now, I mentioned that there may be a range. So if you're at negative 1, 0, or 1, is 100 milligrams per day really going to make a difference? Is 7 grams of fiber really going to make a difference? Um, but for these other biomarkers like copper um, or niacin or B12 going the wrong direction you know, uh, really following as close to the correlations as possible, those correlation rules may be better relative to the ones that are right around zero, zero, negative one, one. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Uh, before you go, I've got some discount links, at-home blood testing using Quantify, and you can get a discount. That will be in the video's description. If you want to measure your own epigenetic age using the Horvath, Hanum, and Dunedin Pace epigenetic clocks, Got a discount link for that in the video's description. Oral microbiome composition, and I just got my results back for test number two, and I'm currently analyzing that to see if it was good, bad, or neutral, so stay tuned for that. If you want to uh, uh, track your diet using Chronometer, I've got a discount link for that, or if you just want to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me a Coffee. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoy the video. Have a great day.